Good morning, church. It is a joy to be together, and for those of you worshiping online, welcome to you as well. It is a joy for all of us to be together wherever we are this Sunday morning. Today is a very special day in uh, our faith tradition. It is Reformation Sunday, so 505 years ago tomorrow, we celebrate um, today because it's Sunday. Tomorrow uh, will be the day that Martin Luther nailed the 95 Thesis to the door of the Wittenberg Church. Um, the spark that ignited the Reformation that has uh, lasted for 505 years. So normally we wear red on Sunday. I forgot and I did not wear my red. Tomorrow's the actual celebration. Ron's got his red tie on, so um, excellent. And it is a joy to celebrate together. Um, I will call us to worship. And uh, as we begin, our call to worship this morning comes from the Psalms and says, Praise the Lord, all you nations. Extol Extol him, all you peoples, for great is his love towards us and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. Sisters and brothers, let us stand and praise the Lord together. Good morning, everyone. Our song in the morning is The Way. Did you know that was the original name of Christianity after Jesus ascended? Christianity was called The Way.
Please be seated. Um, so as we gather for worship, I invite you to find the connection card in your bulletin to fill that out. Let us know that you're worshiping with us. On the back of that card is a place where you can share your prayers with us. If you check confidential, only our pastors will see it. Otherwise, our elders, our deacons, our prayer teams will pray with and for you. And for those of you worshiping online, you can click above where you're watching that says connection card, and you can complete your connection card in that way. And also, please share your prayers with us. Um, As we uh, continue to worship, I have a few exciting announcements to share with you all about ways to get connected here at the church and engage. The first one is um, next Saturday morning in this room, and this one's only for the men, sorry ladies, um, there's a men's breakfast at 8 a.m. next Saturday here. You don't need to sign up or register. Uh, If you have questions, you can let me know, Um, but that will be in this room, um, free breakfast, can't beat it. The following day, so Sunday, uh, November 6th, after worship at 5 p.m., we will all gather back here for our first potluck. I believe this is the first potluck we've had since before COVID. So um, we're still celebrating things coming back. Um, So we have a potluck in this room. Uh, So that you know what to bring, check the bulletin. I have not memorized the alphabet breakdown, but you're either bringing a side or a dessert, I believe. Um, we, uh, We will be checking. So please don't um, overload us with desserts. Bring sides if you're, I think, the first half of the alphabet. That information is there. We'll provide the the main course, um, fried chicken. A great event for the church family. It will be VBS style. If you were here with us over the summer, we'll eat all together. Then the kids will go do some um, exciting activities and the adults will move to the sanctuary and Pastor Nate Griffin from Chosen for Completion will be with us that evening. We are also collecting LED Christmas lights. So you can bring them next Sunday if you wanna purchase them this week or if you have them today, but they need to be new LED Christmas lights in the box and we will mail those to the USS Bush. Uh, The CO has given them permission and the electricians have cleared it for them to decorate their workspace for Christmas, but they have to be LED and they have to be new in the box for safety. Um, One final announcement, exciting event, and as I make this one, I'm going to invite James to come up and join me. Um, But in your bulletin, there's an insert. Movement Day 2022 is November 12th here at FPC from 8.30 to 12.30 p.m. Lunch is included. Uh, You're starting to notice a theme that when we gather, we have food. Um, So there's another meal opportunity for you and a great uh, event to be together as we discuss ways to dismantle the school to prison pipeline. One final celebration and most exciting as well as we have all of these events that we gather, we always celebrate our new members. So this is James Cover. Um, James joined the church in September but is a busy guy and we're finally getting around to introducing him. Um, if you've been to the men's group, if you've been to Soup Kitchen, you may have met James and it's a joy for us to officially welcome you in front of everybody as a member. And as always, we have a gift for you. Um, So this is what we call our towel of servanthood. It reminds us of our call as a church to be the hands and feet of Christ in the world. And it says on it, um, these words from Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, he said this to his disciples. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should also wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. James, you're already a great servant, but this is a reminder for you to continue to serve as the hands and feet of Christ as you live out your calling with us. So with that, I invite you, welcome James. Um, I invite you to stand and greet one another and also greet James.
All right, I am not calling the kids up yet. So children, sit down, stay where you are. And before we have our children's sermon, I am super excited to celebrate today our third graders as they receive their third grade Bible in front of our church congregation. So um, I would like to invite our third graders up that are here um, to stand on the stage. And as our third graders are coming up, I would like to invite Ron Fritch and Yvonne Rogers, who are our third grade Bible teachers up, to tell you a little bit about our third grade Bible curriculum and why this is such an important milestone in our children's spiritual formation. They come, here they come. Stand right here. Stand right there. Hold on. Good morning. It's turning on, yeah. Good morning. There we go. I could probably not use this, but I won't do that. So anyhow, my name is Ron Fritsch. I've been teaching the third grade Bible class now. This is the fifth year. And I just want to speak a little bit to all of you about what this is all about. This is a year our kids really start to dive into the Bible. We use what is the Adventure Bible, and they're getting a much nicer looking one than the one I've got in front of me right here today. But we've been using this for several, several years, and what we found is there was no curriculum for it. So we created our own curriculum, and the curriculum has worked very, very well for many years. And the curriculum is designed to use all of the kids' various senses. So we don't just lecture in class, we participate. We sing, we dance, we play games, and we learn how to use our Bible effectively because there's a lot of tools in there. But the thing that's really cool is when they first really, that light bulb goes off and you find it. So I encourage you to really encourage your kids at home as well, which brings me to point number two, which is we also give the kids a journal at the beginning of the year. And I tell them that's fun work, right? We give them a couple of assignments every year, every week to take home the family. And the intent is that you as a family spend time on these assignments together. It's an opportunity for you to share together, talk a little about what you know, what you've learned, and to have them tell you what they're learning and know. Why is that important? Well, at most in church, we generally get your kids at best two hours, one for Sunday school and one for worship. You have them 166. Okay, so most of the influence in faith and everything else is going to come from in the family. And I do believe in faith in the family. And we do our part to get you started, but we really appreciate all your efforts at home. We see it in the kids. We love what you do, and we just encourage you to keep doing. So with that, without further ado, we want to introduce each of these students and give them their wonderful blue bound Bible. So any of them that have siblings that have the brown Bible, you'll be able to tell them apart. So, first on our list is Jack Beasley. And then we have Luke Lame, Lamer, right? Lamer, Lamer. If I don't get names right, parents, I apologize. Try Fritch a few times. <laughs> okay, how's Jacob today? So we have Jacob Gott, Gott, sorry, <laughs> the kids will get me right. That's the other thing about, neat about teaching kids. They're honest, not afraid, and eager to share. <laughs> then we have Michaela, and this is Michaela Collins, and I saw Grandpa today, I used to work with Grandpa, so. And then we have Helen, and Helen Hughes. And Helen's, three of these kids have siblings that were in our class last year. So it's great to see the families continuing through. So I wish you would give them all a big hand. And with that, I'd like to introduce Pastor Jim. You all know him. And he's let's, going to give us his say as a prayer. Let's pray for, uh, let's pray for our kids in a, in a beautiful way today. Uh, Father, we thank you and praise you for this day, and we thank you for the gift of your church, Lord Jesus. We thank you for your spirit that comes and rests upon us and rests upon these children and their families. We pray, Lord, that as they are raised in the ways of you, 
that they would become the voice and the heart and the feet and the spirit of you so that this world might know love through them. We pray for safety and security. We pray for wholeness and peace in all their families. In the beautiful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Wonderful. Wonderful. So I'm going to invite the rest of our kids to come up now for a brief children's sermon. But Mr. Ron did such a good job connecting. Come on here, take a seat. So um, Ron talked about the fact that we have only two hours with you. Now, fortunately, the Gauts, I've got like 52 hours with a lot of them every week. Um, but um, we have a short amount of time to be with each other every week, which is why it's so important, put your eyes on my eyes, that your parents um, do so much of the hard work of making sure that you grow up to love Jesus so much, right? So raise your hand if this um, journal looks familiar to you. And raise your hand if, if I mailed you one of these. If you don't have one of these Bibles, moms and dads, I wanna give you one after church today as a gift from our church, because we believe that if you read your Bible with your kiddos every single night, it is a wonderful way to start with the faith formation of your kiddos. So, hey, shh. Um, <laughs> um, so we have a journal here that will help the parents um, get through how we want you to help grow your kids in Christ. Put that away for the love of Pete. You know it's bad news when somebody brings a sparkly purse up on the stage and it shakes when you um, carry it. There's something that's in the purse. All right, so today what I did, I brought, what is this? Look at it. What are they? And what are you supposed to do with these? Plant them. Well, what if you plant them and they have no sun and no water? What will happen to them? They won't grow at all, right? So Paul, Jim is going to talk. Yep, Jim is going to talk about um, Paul today, and in this um, First Corinthians, the third chapter, and he's going to talk about how God calls us the field, and we are the seeds, right? Because we are Christians and we love Jesus, Lincoln. We love Jesus, but our parents are the farmers. The parents are the ones that make sure that we, we get watered, right? And that you have plenty of sun. But with, so our parents do all the hard work, um, but without God, nothing will happen, right? So we need God. So we come to church, we read the Bible, we learn how to grow in love with him, right? So we are gonna to talk today in Children's Church about how we are the seeds and the field and our parents are the farmers that do the work and plant the, and plant the seeds and that through the farmer's help, God helps us grow into folks that um, love them and we wanna be good people that do good things for folks and all of that great stuff. So I'm gonna close this in prayer and we're gonna to head to Children's Church. Oh my gosh, put that away. Makeup just came out now. A whole makeup palette. I'll give you one guess who that belongs to. All right. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day, Lord, and I thank you for laughter and giggles, and I thank you that I have the best job in the entire world because I get to love all these kids. So I can't imagine how great that must feel to you because you love them way more than I do. Um, we pray today, Lord, that we give our parents, the farmers, the strength to water um, the seeds, to shh, Put the seeds in the sunlight, Lord, and we pray that the seeds will listen when they need to listen and stop talking when they need to stop talking. And we um, are so thankful, Lord, that we can be here today to learn how to be more in love with you. In your heavenly name, amen. All right, we're going to walk out for Children's Church now. Not, we're not jumping off. We're walking down the steps. You guys cannot bring that anymore. <laughs> Good stuff, good stuff. So Bibles, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 
I mean, excuse me, 1 Corinthians chapter three. <laughs> I'm so used to going to the 13th chapter. Uh, and we're gonna come to it in a minute. So this is what we call Reformation Sunday. It's the Sunday closest to All Hallows' Eve, which we have shortened into saying Halloween. So in the church tradition, there's All Hallows' Eve, which is the last day of October, and then the first day of November is what's called All Saints' Day. And it was on All Hallows' Eve in 1517 that Martin Luther created, in, in a sense, really the first modern blog. He, he wrote 95 things, uh, topics that he said are worthy of being talked of and talked about in the church. And he posted them on the Wittenberg church door and uh, within four years he was kicked out of the church. Uh, was removed simply because he, he wanted to talk about some things that the church didn't want to talk about. <clears throat> and what came from that is what we call the Reformation. It's what we call the Protestant tradition. So that we were the protesters to what we said were uh, misunderstandings, abuses within the church. And so that's really where we all come together. And Martin Luther, in, in essence, there's all kinds of really interesting stuff about Luther, right? But in essence, what Luther did was he came up with what we today call the three solas the three onlys, sola fide, sola gratia, sola scriptura. And it was simply to say that it is faith alone. It's not by works that we are saved. We are, we are saved by, by our faith and really Jesus' faith in us. It is grace alone. There's nothing that we did. We didn't earn it. We don't do anything to lose it. We, we, the Bible tells us while we were yet in our sins, while we were still in our sins, he loved us. So it's grace alone. And then sola scriptura, it is by scripture alone. And so everything that we try to do as a people of God, we try to say, let's find, if it, find it in Scripture. And so one of those differences for us with Roman Catholics would be, Roman Catholics have seven sacraments. They're all great things, by the way. Um, ordination's a great thing, marriage is a great thing, prayers for the sick and the dying is a great thing. I mean, if those are all, you know, all of those are beautiful things. But what we've said is for us, a sacrament is something that is found in Scripture, it is a mandate or called by Jesus to do, by you know, himself, by Jesus to do. And, and then that there's a special means of grace. There's something that happens when we, when we celebrate those sacraments. And so you remember for us what our two sacraments are, the Lord's table, which we'll celebrate next Sunday, and then the sacrament of baptism. Both, both calls and commands of Jesus to do, all, both of those with a simple sense of grace. Now, that's all to kind of set the stage. Um, one of the things that that I like to ask groups when I'm, if I'm going out and consulting or teaching or doing something in another context is I, I like to ask this question. If um, God forbid there's a fire in your house and you know there's only one thing you can take, an inanimate thing, not, not your family, your kids, your, your pets, whatever, but there's one inanimate thing you can take from your house, what would it be? It's a great question. I mean, what would be the one the one thing, the one inanimate thing you would, the, the one thing you would take. And I'll tell you the answer has shifted over the last 10 or 15 years. Right now, the number one answer is this, I'd take my computer. Um, and I used to think, wow, that's just, that's just terrible, right? You can get a computer anywhere. But what that really means is like, that's where all my photos are. That's where all my memories are, are stored or whatever before we kind of get to the you know, before we got to the cloud and all. So, but, but here, here's what I would take. In, in my home, I, there's certainly one thing. I would take a little celery dish. Um, it's just because I like celery. <laughs> I, I was baptized in that celery dish at home. Um, all three of my boys were baptized and all three of our grandkids, I mean, two of our grandkids, two right now, uh, of our grandkids have been baptized out, out of that bowl. So that's, that's the one thing I would take. If I was in my study here at the church, this is the one thing I'd take, this. I use this every single week. I mean, there's rarely a week that goes by that I don't use it. I use it to underline things, I use it to mark things. It's a ruler. And here's why I would take it, because on the back it says, Guy I. Smith, December 11th, 1889. Mr. and Mrs. Smith, were snowbirds from Buffalo, New York when I was a kid. When they retired, they had no kids. They'd been married like 60 something years. They decided that they would move to Miami where I grew up. They bought a little bungalow next to our little bungalow, a little neighborhood in Miami. And the Smiths became my grandparents, which I didn't have. They loved me when I wasn't lovable. They chose to love me. They welcomed me into their home. 
they gave, they gave, they shared their life with me in amazingly beautiful, beautiful ways. This was his ruler that was given to him on his birthday in his first grade because his dad couldn't afford to buy a ruler for him for school. He went and borrowed one, took a piece of wood, and measured it into 12 inches and marked it. He gave it to me on my birthday in the first grade. When the Smiths died, they left me in their will. True story. I think I was like five or six, I was probably six years old. They left me in their will and um, they left me $500. They had no kids, but a niece contested the will and I didn't get the $500. I could have cared less. What mattered to me was that they remembered me even in their death. They remembered me. This is a visible reminder of an invisible grace that was in my life before I even knew Jesus. In a sense, that's what we call sacraments, right? I'm not saying this is sacramental, but I am saying it's pretty darn close. It's a reminder of being loved and chosen. Now, there are other kind of reminders. The flip side is this. How many of you have ever worried? About half of you are honest, okay? <clears throat> how, many of you, uh, how many of you have ever known someone? This is an easy way to do it, right? I'll deflect it. How many of you have ever known someone that really worried a lot? Okay, well, more hands went up right of that one. How many of you have actually known someone who actually seems to worry sometimes even more when things are going better? Oh yeah, okay. So, he, so, so I, I really think about this. I mean, like, I can't tell you how many times, like last night, I wake up at three in the morning and there's something in my head and I can't get it out. Are we together? I mean, it's just like a worry. It's a worry, it's a worry. And the thing that's interesting to me is that there are many times in life when things are actually going better that it's like, oh yeah, it's going so well now, but something's gonna happen. There's gonna be a shoe that's gonna drop, right? And it's like I'm preparing myself for this bad thing. Are we together? Okay, so, so, here, so here's, here's something I came across recently, and it's not new, I just happened to come across it. It was an article by a, a psychologist, a psychoanalyst called Donald, named Donald Winnicott. And what Donald Winnicott says, which is said by others, is that for those of us, for those people that we may know, someone else, right, that, that worry, especially worry, seem to worry even more perhaps when things seem to be going well, like, oh, the shoe's, oh, the shoe's gonna drop, they're actually shaped by a prior memory of something going bad. And the thing that's interesting, he he actually says the catastrophe we fear will happen has already happened. So there's something that happened to us in our past that made us think like that. And the interesting thing about it is that for most of us, we don't remember what it was. It happened perhaps in childhood, Something, something shaped us in a way that we don't, rec- we don't really remember what it was, but it was like that one fear of, oh, this happened, has now been taken within us, and it, and it has been sort of a, a, ameliorated or sent out into all of our experiences where we just start to think, wow, that could happen, that could happen, that could happen. And, and I think about this forgotten trauma, and I wonder, you know, is that... Is that it or, I mean, I have this, I have this reminder of, of an unconditional accepting chosen love and yet maybe there's still something within, within me of this. So what do those two have in common? Here's what they have in common that's absolutely critical to know. They both are about experience. What we've been through, even if we don't remember it, shapes what we think and who we are and how we go forward. Ah, wow. The beautiful things, the memories of being chosen and loved unconditionally, they're based on our experience. But what makes them different? Every worry is the most lonely place you can be. Wake up at three in the morning and have that worry and you feel, I feel as if I, it is just me. And I gotta figure it out, I gotta get it together, I gotta work it out, and it's just me. It's a solipsistic living. It's this living of, of like, oh, 
I've got to figure it out. I've got to work it out. And it divides me. It isolates me. But the ruler, this, this sacramental kind of love, it makes us one with others. It draws us into an experience, not of, of, of isolation, but it draws us into an experience of, of, of a communal, of, of, a, of a corporate, of a, of a giving love. And so, so how do you choose? How do you choose to, to, to live this and not this? How do you choose? Well, it all comes in how you choose to measure. So there's a... <clears throat> Tennessee Williams, who I, I think is absolutely amazing in, in, so many, so many different, in so many different ways. But my favorite Tennessee Williams writing is a short story. Um, and it's called Something by Tolstoy. And I don't know if you've ever read it. It's really, it's, an, it's a neat little short story. And so, so here's, here's what it is. It's a, there's a, a young man who's a, a Russian Jew in Europe. And uh, he, um, his dad has a bookstore. And their apartment is over the bookstore. And uh, this young man falls in love with this French girl, and he's just enamored with her. And he's he's uh, he's he's uh, introverted. He he's 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 uh, he likes things quiet and all, but she's vibrant and active and all. And he wants to marry her, but her dad his dad says no. You have to go to college. So, begrudgingly, he goes to college. While he's in college, his dad dies. He comes back. He marries the girl. He runs the bookstore, and he moves into the apartment that his dad had up over. And he is totally, completely in love. But he's quiet and hesitant, and he's a bookstore kind of guy. And she's outgoing and vibrant. And, and so one day, this vaudeville producer comes through and says, oh, you, here's her sing. You have a beautiful voice. You could come with me and do th- something in vaudeville. And so she decides to leave. She goes with this man. And as she's going, this bookstore owner gives her a key to the front door of the bookstore which then gets her into their apartment. And he says, take this key with you because your love is not so much less than mine that you will not want to return. You'll be back and want to use this. And she leaves with the key. And he turns to his books. And he reads and he reads and he reads at his desk so much that the bookstore is not thriving. It's just, but he reads and he reads and William says it's really even his eyesight starts to change, that it becomes just what he can see in front of him, and he reads, and he reads, and he reads, and that's where he finds his solace. One day, Christmas time, 15 years later, a woman pulls a key out of her pocket and opens the door to a bookstore and walks in. She hears him, he says, excuse me, is there something I can help you with? She comes to the desk and she stands before him. He looks up and has no recognition of who she is. She says, do you remember me? He says, no, I'm sorry, have you bought a book here before? She said, no. So, well, what can I help you with? She says, well, I'm looking for a book. Oh, what is it? I'm looking for a book about a a young man who went away to college and his dad died and he came back and he opened uh, his dad's bookstore and he married the love of his life and they lived above the bookstore until one day a man came from vaudeville and said, you can make it. And she left, but before she left, she was given a key and he said to her, there's, there's no way that your love is less than mine so that you will be back and you will want to use that key. Do you remember that story she says to Jacob Brodsky? Jacob says, no, I don't remember that. And she goes on, don't you remember the story of, the love story of Jacob and Lila? No, I don't remember it. She says, you must remember it. He says, well, now that you mention it, maybe I do. It sounds like something by Tolstoy. She screams and cries and drops the key and runs out. And I wonder how many times you and I 
have taken to our books, the things that give us solace, the things that distract, the things that occupy, and we have lost our first love. And I think of the church and how easy it is to take up the things. I think of our lives, our marriages, I think of our families, and how easy it is to take up the things to where our eyes can only see the things and miss the love. Paul's writing a letter to the Corinthian church. Corinth is a really interesting place. It's really interesting, and we miss this almost always when we read 1 Corinthians. <clears throat> so here's the thing. There's these two great big bodies of water, and there's a narrow isthmus in Greece. It's still there. And the Greeks ended up taking and building a canal between both of those great bodies of water. And so all these massive ships that would come, they would dock on each side of that isthmus. It's about 50 miles or so north of Athens. They would come, and they would take canal, not the boats, but they would have these little boats that would go from canal to can and connect all of this commerce. So Corinth was a city, it existed, but it exploded when that canal was put in. And it exploded with nouveau riche. It exploded with people who, who made money off of commerce. They were, they were cosmopolitan. They were from all different kinds of areas. And they came into a town that was just overwhelmed with all these new people. And so when they're overwhelmed with all these new people, the culture changes very quickly. And the culture became one of who has and who doesn't. It became a culture of who has money, who doesn't. Who's made money off of this, who hasn't. It's become a culture off of status. And the status has, has created all these kinds of divisions, and it has created the sort of debaucherous thing. Outside of the commerce of that canal, it's recommended that more money was transmitted over prostitution than anything else. It's just this sort of kind of old school seaport kind of thing, right? I mean, but it's, it's this, and so there's all this money, there's all this measurement, and there's all this need to belong and to fit in and to do all of this, and it's all measured on this, 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 and this. Who has and who doesn't have? Who has more and who doesn't have more? And so Paul comes and he plants a church there. He spends about 18 months, a year and a half, and, and now he's been away for a while. And he's writing to them. And he's saying to them, in essence, and if you read the first chapter of 1 Corinthians, you'll pick this up. He says to them, in essence, that you really are you have become like the people that you're supposed to bring the gospel to. You've started measuring yourself even in the church against each other. And here's the thing that you really need to measure yourself with, and this is what I find so beautiful, and it's something that we almost always miss in, in, in his letters to the Corinthians. He says this, he says, he says, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And then he talks about the cross, the crucified Jesus, the cross, the crucifixion, over and over and over. And why does he talk about it? Because he says, we're gonna measure ourselves by something entirely different. We're gonna measure ourselves by a love, a first love that was given to us. And it has nothing to do about what you have. It has everything to do about whose you are. And we're going to measure ourselves by something that nobody else in the world will see. We're going to measure ourselves by a God that's been defeated by the Greeks, by the Romans. We're going to measure ourselves by, 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 by a God who, who seems to have no value, no purpose, nothing in the world. But to it's foolishness to the world. But to us, it is everything. Because what we're going to say as the people of God is that it is His love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. It is his love that is gonna define everything. And that love is sacrificial and that love will never be measured by the world of having any value. But for us, it's everything we have. And whenever we start to measure ourselves, even in the church, when we start to measure ourselves against each other, who has this gift, who has that gift, who does this, who does that, who's known, who's not, whose name shows up here, Whenever we start, then we start to bring in something. And so this is what he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as by people who are still worldly. He calls them worldly. And then he says this in verse 3. You are still worldly. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? 
Are you not acting like mere humans? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another says, I follow Apollos, are you not mere human beings? Now, Paul and Apollos don't have any issue with each other. They're not competing. But people are saying, oh, I'm a Presbyterian, or I'm a Lutheran, or I'm Catholic, or I'm non-denominational. I'm one of those spiritual Christians that doesn't need to go. We start, whenever we start to, we lose the power of the, of, of the sacrificial giving of the cross. And, and I think this is so interesting. He says, are you still worldly? When we look at it and say, what is it to be worldly? We think about you do all this bad stuff. Oh, you went to the prostitute. You went, oh, Lord, you, 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 got, you got drunk in this thing and embarrassed. Oh, or, or you're worldly because, oh, Lord. no, no, that's not what he says. Are you still worldly? You are. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are not you worldly? What makes us worldly is the measuring. It's, it's the jealousy and the quarreling, even within the body of Christ, he says. And what, what Paul ultimately is getting at throughout all of this letter, and the second letter as well, is that grace is undeserved. It's free, but it's not cheap. It came at the cost of the Son of God. But that love is to be shared. And one of the things that we mess up so often on is we use a bad measurement for love. You see, what we do is we believe that love is a limited capacity, that we only have a limited capacity to love. I have one child, why would I have two? I couldn't love the two as much. I have this community that I love. How could I love? I have, I have this that I need to, this, this love that I need to focus. How, how could I love more? And, and every time we do, we we miss the, the truth. The truth is that the heart is infinitely expandable. This is the image of God. God created and continues to create. God didn't create the world all those years ago. God created it today. It continues. And when we recognize that, when we recognize that this, 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 this first understanding of the, the gospel of Christ is about love, it changes everything. Because then when we recognize that the heart is infinitely expandable, then we're called to love the other. Oh. And to love the other as much as we love our own. To welcome the other. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Um, this is interesting. You know that's not his birth name, right? I mean, most of us have forgotten this. I don't think his birth certificate was actually changed until he was like 17 or something. But when Michael King Sr., when his son, Michael King Jr., was five years old, he was invited to go on kind of a world tour. He went to the Holy Land, uh, saw a lot of different things. But then he was, primarily he went to go to a conference, a Baptist conference in Germany. And it was one year after he was there, it was one year after Hitler became the Chancellor of Germany. And what this African-American preacher from the Deep South, from a little small church, honestly, what he, what he encountered changed everything in his understanding of the gospel. He encountered people already who were willing to defy what they saw as the evil and the oppression of the Nazis. They were willing to cast everything for the cost of Christ. They were willing to live into the crucifixion. And he began to study while he was there and he began to understand and he realized that this really, all of this sort of, this protesting, this, this, this defiance, it all came as he understood it, he came from Martin Luther. And so he, he came back and he says, I'm no longer Michael L. King, I'm Martin Luther King, senior, and this is my son, five years old, who's now Martin Luther King, junior. And it's that, it's that young man who grew up you know, he was 35 years old when he won the Nobel Peace Prize, youngest ever in history. A year before he won the Nobel Peace Prize, he said this, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We hear that all the time. But listen to what he also said. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught 
and an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. This comes, my friends, from an understanding of the gospel of Jesus Christ that is a cross that is a giving love, a self-giving love, a love that means more than anything else that could ever be measured in this world. And this is where the spiritual journey begins. It begins not by proclaiming truth. I'm not saying there isn't a truth, it's all true. I mean, I get the truth, I'm not minimizing that, but I don't think we begin with that. I don't think we're much interested in truth anymore. This is what I think we're interested in. What is good? What is good? And the truth comes. But what is good? In a world of brokenness and loss, in lives where Sometimes we worry simply because we worry and we worry obviously when things seem to be going better sometimes because we just don't know what to do because it just seems like there's this prior trauma, whatever it may be that we don't remember but it still shapes us in our lives individually and our lives corporately and our lives as a community, our lives as a church and our lives as a nation. There's something bigger and all people are drawn to something that's bigger than themselves. It's a desire, it's a pull toward love. It's a story in the 15th chapter of the Gospel of Luke that exists only in our church. When I say our church, not this church, but only within the Christian faith. It's a story of a man who says, a boy really, who says, I want my dad dead, I want him dead. I wish he was dead so I could have what he has to give me now. And his dad says, if you want me dead, okay. You can have it now. And he takes this portion of the inheritance and he gives it to him. And that boy goes off and he leaves and he lives the life that he thought he wanted. And he realizes at the end of it, that uh, of the day really for him, that, that, that he lost everything. It wasn't what he wanted, and he, he's so broken now, he's actually, he's the best he can do is live with the pigs. And for a, for, for a good Jewish boy to live with the pigs is not a good thing. And then the Bible says he came to his senses and He decided, well, I'd be better to work for my dad than than, than to do this. And he can only imagine what he wonders. And so he girds up his loins and he goes back. And as he goes back, his his dad is sitting at the window as, as he must have done every single day. And the Bible says he sees way off his son. And he jumps up from his chair and he pulls up his robes, exposes his legs, humiliates himself as a, as a Jewish man. He runs to the door, he opens the door and he runs through the town. And he grabs his son. It's one what's lost, lost is now found. Let us celebrate. We don't have a God that waits. We have a God who waits so he can run. We have a God who comes to us and to this world. And we are called to have the same love, to be created in the same image. Where we don't wait, we wait so that we can run. We wait so that we can embrace. We wait so that we can give a love to the other, to love to to those who need the forgiveness for those who for those who've even wanted us dead. We run. And this is the measure for our lives. This is why Paul says it's about the crucified Lord. This is the measure for our lives. So what about us? Is the worry enough? Is it helping you? Or is the measurement to know that somewhere along the way you were chosen. Not because of anything you did or who you were. You were chosen. And you were loved. Here's the beautiful bad thing. 
You get to choose when you leave here. You still get to choose. You can choose to worry. Or you can choose to be chosen. And God will honor your choice. Father, I pray that today we choose to see the love that you have for us. Just as the father who waited at the window every day, his love never failed. And we pray that sooner than later, Lord, we will turn and let him see us even a long way off so that he will run to us and celebrate. And we pray the amazing, beautiful privilege that we ourselves might be in the image of you, that father, that mother, that brother, that sister, that friend who waits ready to run. Enough with worry. Let us measure ourselves by your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Sisters and brothers, we have the opportunity to respond to God's goodness and faithfulness and worship as we bring our tithes, our offerings, and collect our prayers. So for those of you in First Hall, if you're sitting on the outside sections, you'll find a basket towards the center of the room. You take that and pass it towards the outside and place your connection card as well as your offerings in that. And for those of you in the center section, our ushers will come forward and pass baskets. Um, For those of you worshiping online, you can click just above where you're watching where it says give and complete your tithe and your offering in that way. Or you can text to give by texting the number 530-5683. So as we collect our offerings and our prayers, we turn uh, to our Lord in prayer as we lift up um, prayers for our world and and particularly solutions uh, to crime and violence in our city. We continue to pray for and with the URC and the partnership we have at Jay Cox Elementary as we uh, tutor and work with students in the afternoons. And we pray for the, the volunteers involved as well as the families, the staff, and of course the students. We have a praise for an amazing trunk or treat on Wednesday, kind of a a weird thing in the church to pray for, but um, it was amazing. We had between four and 500 people. Um, We estimate it was too many to count, it seems like. Um, Just a wonderful time of being together and welcoming um, people from the neighborhood and the community and being together um, and and enjoying one another's uh, presence and pouring into those relationships. Um, We also have a praise for our our youth who volunteered yesterday in the soup kitchen. And we lift up um, prayers this coming weekend for our potluck as we gather back together and the breakfast on Saturday morning and also for Movement Day the following week. We're thankful this morning at the 11 a.m. service to have the Norfolk State uh, University Concert Choir uh, led by Mr. Terry Butler. And if you're planning on staying for that service afterwards, there'll be a reception uh, to meet them and to to welcome them with hospitality um, to be with us. We received, uh, we received 85 prayer requests through our connection cards last week. Prayers for family, friends, for healing, for provision, and for those experiencing loss. Sisters and brothers, let us pray. Gracious and merciful God, we gather before you this morning. We gather with joy and thanksgiving, and we gather um, with confession. We gather with ad- admittance that we Um, tend to the worldly ways, that we tend to um, worry and anxiety, that we tend towards carrying burdens on our own, Lord. And we thank you and we praise you this morning for the call, for the gift to come and to lay our worries, our anxieties, our burdens at the foot of the cross and to choose to live in a still more perfect way as as we choose to reflect your love and your light in this world. We thank you for the calling that you've placed on our lives as um, you call us into relationship with one another and you call us into service as your hands and feet in this world and to be a kingdom presence to those who are seeking hope and love and light. We lift up these prayers of, um, of opportunities to serve, of opportunities to be in community and relationship 
and opportunities to worship. And as we gather together this morning before your throne, Lord, we join our voices together and pray in the way that you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Sisters and brothers, let us stand as we continue to worship our Lord. Amen, amen. If you're worshiping with us for the first time, we've got a gift for you. It's a book by Rick Warren called What on Earth Am I Here For? It's short, but it's great. It's really about purpose in life, and it's free. You don't have to sign anything or shake a hand. Just when you go out the doors, look between the doors. There's a big table there. Uh, please take one. If you want to hold up something in prayer, our prayer team has been praying for us throughout this service. They'll be up here at the front at the end of the service. Come on up. Take advantage of whatever it is you want to hold up in prayer. Give them the gift as well. And as we go out, I want to encourage you, invite someone to come to church. Uh, all the studies say 80 to 85% of people say they would come if somebody invited them, even people who aren't believers. Uh, we believe that there's something of grace and love and wholeness that is offered here that we would love to be able to share with the world, and it comes by, by you and by your invitation. So please, please consider doing that. You'll see bags for new people in your, in your neighborhood that are city-specific. You'll see those on the wall. All kinds of ways to be able to do that. And so now as we go forward, my friends, I pray that, I pray that we, will, we will be a people who, who measure our lives not against and opposed and in comparative ways to each other, but instead we will measure our lives by the love of Christ who loved us so much that he gave his life for us. Let, it, let that be the proclamation for this world. We pray all of this and we lift all of this up in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face on.
have a great thing. weekend, weekday, and month, everything. God's good. <laughs>